All right, my name is Matthew Monk. We're here interviewing Gay McGeary. Gay, what's your name? Gay McGeary. Uh, when and where were you born? In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Glenside, a suburb of Philadelphia. And uh, where have you lived throughout your life? Uh, grew, uh, we raised our children in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, then we moved to Florida briefly in Coral Gables, and we've been here in central Pennsylvania for about 26 years. All right. Um, what jobs or careers have you had? Um, when the kids went back to school, went to college, I went to college and got my business degree, got my MBA and CPA, and I was an accountant for almost 20 years. Oh, that's great. Um, and what do you do for a living now? I'm retired. Oh, so now with the background stuff out of the way, we'll move into the coverlet-related okay. questions. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you first got started weaving and, and how you branched out into coverlets specifically. Okay. Uh, I grew up with my great-great-grandmother's figured in fancy coverlet draped across the den sofa. And shortly after I got married, um, I, my mother gave me a double woven coverlet. And then we went to a museum one time and I saw weaving and, and uh, they had lessons and I thought, well, this would be interesting. So I have to say from the very beginning, I wanted to weave coverlets. And how did you learn to weave? Um, I took a couple classes in learning how to warp the loom and how to we, uh, um, interpret a draft. And then I got a 16 shaft, very large loom and I would see a coverlet. My first coverlet was an overshot coverlet we purchased and I made one just like it. And then my second coverlet was a um, five block summer and winter coverlet that was like my double weave coverlet for my family, which I couldn't weave on 20 shafts. So each, uh, in those early days in 72 to 88, I just took a weave structure and wove a coverlet as sort of a, you okay. know, try it out. Yeah, I taught myself how to weave yeah. coverlets, basically. There was not much written in those days. Right. Um, Mary Black's new key to weaving taught me how to do what they call fabric analysis, okay. where you can take a coverlet and determine what the draft is. Right. It's a process. And, and then she also had a section on block design. Okay. So those two things sort of got, gave me the tools I needed to do. So describe a little bit, talk a little bit about your own research and scholarship uh, into Pennsylvania German cover the weaving. Okay, when I came back to weaving in um, 2005, the Hirsch's, Charles and Handy Hirsch, lived down the street. And they published this book called Rural, Pens Rural Pennsylvania German Weaving. So I, I had done a lot of this stuff, but I didn't realize it was Pennsylvania German. Right. I had seen manuscripts when I wove early on, but I didn't know the, the cultural background of them. Right. So that sort of clued me in on what I was interested in. So, uh, and these, these are pretty much what a novice weaver would write out when he was studying with the master weaver. In fact, they have two manuscripts at the back of their book, copies of them. And one is Christian Fry that says, Coverlet's book for which I worked 10 months by Joseph Kittinger, that would be the master weaver, in the year 1833 from August till June 1834. So these, these manuscripts don't necessarily show what they wove, but what they might have woven th right. that they learned from their master weaver. Okay. Um, and then it, it was a combination. Now I lived in the part of the country where they had a lot of the Pennsylvania German coverlets. Examples I could find, a lot of them I purchased and brought home and picked over and studied and, and wrote about them. And then I wove them. All right. Um, so what are the different styles and variations of woven coverlets that are out there? I know okay. there's quite a few. If you could talk a little bit about the different styles sure. and maybe the structure. Um, there's two basic styles, and they are the figured and fancy, which I think pretty much was named by Clarita Anderson when I wasn't weaving. Right. And we used to call them jacquard coverlets because they were woven on a loom with a jacquard attachment. But they discovered along the way that there were other types of looms that were possibly used as well. Right. And then there is the geometric uh, coverlets, which are uh, much plainer in design. They start out with the concept you need two points to create a pattern, and you can take each point and make it into a block instead. And, and some of the patterns actually are just two blocks, okay. and they go up to 22 blocks. Oh, wow. So um, that was the basic part of um, the okay. um. So uh, explain the, the, the various weave structures of woven coverlets. Most people think uh, about coverlets, they think of overshot coverlets that are woven on four shafts pretty much by the English weavers. Right. And they think of summer and winter coverlets, which were also English. And then they uh, think of the double woven coverlets, which were woven by both Pennsylvania German and your English weavers. Right. 
Um, but there's so much more out there, and the Pennsylvania Germans are the ones who did a lot of it. You have what they call turn twill, where they will take the same block design that was done on double weave and do it in turn twill, but it has lines, diagonal lines going through. It right. looks much different. And then you have turn satin, you have star point twill, you have plain point twill, you have broken twill, and you have star work, right. which is what I've done a lot of. Right. What is star work? Star work is where they took a point twill star, which would be just point changes in the, um, the motif. This is a star work star. So instead of having one point change, it has a block change with five threads. So that enlarges the pattern. This was the one thing that the German, the German linen weavers brought over their books from Germany, and right. they used those as the basis for their coverlets. But this is considered the one invention of the American Pennsylvania German weavers. So they enlarged these motifs. They were more interesting in coverlets. Right. They could come up with stylized trees for the borders, and uh, they're just much more unique. What is the design inspiration for your coverlets? Okay, um, this is the first coverlet I wove when I came back to weaving. And what I started with is with an old coverlet. It is a star and diamond coverlet in the star work pattern. Okay, this was the original early coverlet that I got. Uh, it was woven on 18 shafts, and at the time I wove this coverlet, I only had 16. So if you understand what you're doing, you can take two blocks out of the design. Okay. And this had three thread blocks, so I made I wanted my pattern to be larger, right. so I made five thread blocks. So the, the, board, the trees are very similar, but the colors are totally different. Right. And the, the old coverlets, most of the time, they had a weft fringe, the pattern on the side, and at the bottom they had cotton. Okay which I don't like the cotton at the bottom. <laughs> I like to see them on the wall and I see them as a unit with fringe all around. Right. And I had, uh, early on, a friend had visited me with a coverlet from an auction in Delaware and it had fringe like this. So I sat down and figured out how it was woven and I used it. It's, I call it a tied um, fringe. It's woven separately and then you cut it down the center and then you sew it onto the bottom of your oh, coverlet. So it's very unique. I've gotten into um, fringes that nobody really has documented right. before. And I thought I'd show you some other pieces, sure. my more recent coverlets, to show you, give you an idea of what I do. Uh, I have a co the show just opened on Sunday in Harrisburg. I don't know if you've been to the State Museum. No, not yet. They have a show called The Art of the State okay. every year. And one of the sections is a craft section, and you, you put, send them photographs and they say yay or nay. And a piece of mine got in. Normally what I do to backtrack a little bit is put 14 yards on the loom. And then I weave three uh, throw size coverlets slash wall hangings. And uh, one of the ones I wove is in this show. And these are the other two. But you can see the difference you can make by using either the dark side and the color. This, the fringe is sticking out. And then I found a weird technique where you can add it at the bottom, which I can't remember where I got it. Someday I'm hoping somebody will tell me. So this is all self-fringe? Yes, that's oh, done separately with a crochet hook at the oh, bottom. Great. It's oh, a real so neat yeah. uh, technique. And then I did this. I thought, I'm documenting these special fringes, but I'm not using them. And you have to sort of downsize them to go on a throw size coverlet. So, and the original of this doesn't look that pretty on the old overshot coverlet that I have. But I, when I did the samples, I really liked it. So I took the light side and then the fringe is on three sides. I'm showing the wrong side. So I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It's beautiful. So it's, I love the pattern. You it's can wonderful. see the different things you can do. Now this coverlet is also one I just took off the loom this year. And this, ha uh, there again, I hadn't really woven a tape fringe that I like that well. So this is woven separately, and then it's sewn on to the coverlet. Of course, they're on the three sides, not the top, because right. that you, being the functional piece, although mine aren't functional, you would pull over your head. So you have either, this uh, has a dark side and a light side. Um, Bill Lineback likes the light side. I like the dark side. I think it has more color. Sometimes like you have to go with one over the right. other. And this one with the special fringe, I kept saying, which side? And I came to the conclusion the next time I do it, I'm going to do it on the dark side. I can do it either side I yeah. want. And uh, I liked it. Now that, this is a point twill. Yeah. This is not a star work. You see the pattern is much smaller. 
and you have these small stars. Oh, right. And that's how you would take it from the small to the big one. Okay. It's the basic same motif, and they did a double border uh, tree. You have a tree out of your uh, rose and a tree out of your stars. And this I wanted to show you because this is a downsized version of this. Oh, okay. Which I was really pleased with. And I have another coverlet similar to this. It's going to be in the 40th anniversary book for the Complex Weavers oh. celebration. It comes out at the end of the year. But I was pleased at how it came out. I thought, well, can't use those big fringes on your small pieces. So what are you going to do? And this is actually, this is a star work weave. But what I'm doing is I'm taking double woven block designs and using the same weave structure. Now it has its, you know, you have, it's not easy to do like summer and winter. Right. It has rules and regulations with the float blocks right. that you have to have, that do it a certain way or it doesn't work. And notice the trees. Okay. These are called Lisbon stars sometimes in the books. Okay. And then I did trees on the side and the bottom. Do you name your patterns at all? When I put them in a show, I okay. do. Okay, okay. The rest of the time, I, yeah. I know that true believers of Pennsylvania German uh, say that if it's not in a book, it's not in a 19th century book, you can't use the term. But I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I balance between wanting to research and right. find out what they did and then doing what I want to. Right, right. No, absolutely. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. In fact, I have to say, because of the um, fiber works weaving program that we have now, I'm having more fun than I did the first time. <laughs> now, tulips seem to be the thing I've been doing recently. And um, this is a coverlet, this is a tulip. And the other ones had different stylized tulips. And um, this was the first piece that I did on my 24 shaft computer cyst loom from Toika. And when I, uh, very rarely these days do I sample things, but I thought, well, it's the first thing on the loom, I better try something. So I did a pillow size sample, and I realized that the pattern was just too big. The floats were going to be too long. So I geared it down, made them smaller th threads to the block, and these are the, the tulips. And then these are your snowballs. And here's your trees. This happened to be my favorite. Oh, it's and great. And that they call this, I call it the nine star. And this is point twill. Yeah. And what they would do is they take and they create soldiers at the bottom. And But some coverlets will repeat, um, whoops, turn it right side for you. They'll have repeats of tulips and stars and trees, and they break all the rules. Right. So I figured I could break a couple rules myself. This, this pattern is not usually used with the tulip, but you know, I was at the end of the warp and I've done a couple warps in this because I think I like it more than anybody else, but I love the soldiers. Yeah, I could not do this with my 16 shaft loom. Yeah. So I had to wait till I got a 20 shaft maycumber to be able to do it. Wow. And now I have afraid I'm gotten too old to use my 20 shaft maycumber and I've sold it. And I, I was sitting there struggling with this and I thought, it was the other one with the, the um, um, tape fringe. Mm -hmm. I thought, right over there is a 24 shaft computer shift loom with one treadle, you know, and you don't have to be killing right. yourself. So that loom left in the spring. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of my, some of the things I've designed. It's amazing. And it's, the process that I go through. Yeah, that's amazing, it's beautiful. Now I use all, as far as materials, I use all, um, Unmercerized cotton because okay. they did. Right, right. And I'm just wanting to look at the the other has a sheen to it, and I, I like the look of the old ones. Right. Uh, I get my single ply wool from uh, Briggs and Little. Bill introduced me to yeah. them, and I get my plied wool from Jaggerspun. Okay. So they're the main, uh, and I buy things wholesale. Yeah. Do you do any dyeing at all? No. Okay. In fact, I was. Uh, sort of concentrating more on what I want to do recently and I had a couple spinning wheels that weren't being used yeah. and all the wool is out of the house and all the spinning wheels have gone because I, I'm a math person. Right. I like that these are threading systems that you use from one weave structure to the right. other but you're able to create beautiful art from the different threading right. systems. How do you develop and design your patterns? You mentioned a little bit about the computer system you use. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I will say that um, both when I'm figuring out a pattern I will uh, put it into the fiber works to try it out. I put the draft, the tie up, and the treadling, right. and then it shows the drawdown. So I'll, I'll figure it out and I sort of test it. Right. And then when I'm planning my work, I'll start out with a, a basic pattern like this, put it into fiber works, and then I multiply it the number of times I want it. And then I do the borders on the side as well, and on the both sides. Mm -hmm. 
And I finally learned how to cut and paste, which is a lot easier than I used to be doing it, to repeat it. Yeah. And then I can take that and uh, put it into my computer sys loom. Now the fun thing with the computer sys loom, for anybody who's a weaver out there, you can do it on a straight draw. Oh. And you sit in the guts of the loom and actually put, press your treadle to bring the right shaft up to thread. Oh. Now I still sit there with my piece of paper with this all written out, yeah. but now it's, uh, the printer has written it out instead of me, right. like I did in the old days, and check it as I go along and write a circle after one inch and two inches, because you could stop and start and forget where you are. Right. And there's always a chance of making a mistake. So um, that's um, basically, plus I do the fringes separately. That only usually, I can almost do the, most of the fringes on a two shaft loom. Okay. I have a little May Cumber right now that yeah. has eight shafts and it's sort of being wasted. I'm using four. Right. And I'm thinking, well, how can I take the other four off if I want to take this someplace to make it lighter? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and then you, you, I wet finish them when I'm done. Okay. And I wet finish the fringe if I'm weaving it separately and then I sew it on. What and do you mean by wet finish? Uh, I just literally put it in a um, tub of water with sort of lukewarm water, mm. sort of massage it to felt it a little bit. Right. I used to be able to put it in my washing machine, but my new washer won't do that. <laughs> so I put it in towels right. to absorb the, uh, and then put it over a drying rack. Okay. And the underneath it, you have your hem. Oh, uh, what I do now is I put a thick hem in there because I want to be able to show these in shows. What kinds of looms uh, did early cover the weavers use? They used, for the geometric, they used what they call a barn loom. Although I had a little old lady in uh, Virginia tell me they call it colonial looms. But they're like big barn beams. And the shafts are just like sticks going across with string heddles this way. Mm -hmm. And then they're connected to wooden lambs and uh, wooden treadles. Now they could, it was easy for the Pennsylvania German to do these multi-shaft things because they could add shafts as long as they had the depth in their loom. It's not like my Maycomber that's, you know, it's right. either set for 16 or 20 or 24. Right. And, um, and, that's, and they usually had a place in the front they could sit. And that's so how, a built-in bench, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing what they did because the equipment is rather imprecise. Yeah. And, you had, and then the reeds were actually made from reeds, so it's not like our metal reeds today. Right. But so they the, did a beautiful job. What looms do you use and why do you use those looms? Uh, I was a great believer in Maycumber. They're a very heavy loom. They have metal um, shafts and metal heddles and uh, they're great big heavy looms. And when I was in my 30s, they were really good. Yeah. And even in my 50s, it was a good workout in 60s. But I'm 73 now, so I found they're a little bit hard to do. Yeah. So I've gone to the new technology and I love my Toyka loom. Yeah. Uh, and my problem is I have short arms and legs. So I'm trying to throw Throw the shuttle over here, which with a 47-inch width, right. and treadle press the treadle over wow. here, and it's it's a little difficult. <laughs> and I I just found that it's like, why are you doing this now? <laughs> right. So the Toyka loom for me is really lets me do the. I only had 20 before. Now I have those extra couple shafts that can weave some of these weaves. Um, so what kinds of special skills, knowledge, and abilities are needed to weave coverlets? Okay. First of all, you have to love coverlets, and you have to see, the, first of all, when you look at it, you have to see the pattern. When I'm speaking to a group, I always say, well, see the individual motif, take this, the design elements apart. You have a main pattern, you have a border, you have a, uh, what, what materials you're using, you have a fringe that uh, encompasses the coverlet, and these are your things that you need to look at and then take them as a design and go from there. And then you have to be able, if today, my case, I love computers. I, I think they're the greatest things. And I, I spend half my time on fiber works, to be honest, planning and researching, and then the other half actually doing what I've planned and researched. So it's, it's um, the both t the two things are very good. Right. Um, so for whom do you weave coverlets and how often do you weave them? I weave them for myself <laughs> because I have the, I can do that. I don't, I'm not, I have some things at History and High and Village Artists and local places in town, but when I'm putting it on the loom, I want it to be for me and I can just play around with it and then have some fun. So what do you think the future of cover the weaving is? I don't know, to be honest. I am the chair of the Complex Weavers, uh, Early American Coverless Study Group. and. There are some longtime members, but I don't see the enthusiasm out there for actually weaving coverlets. They're weaving samples, um, 
and they're a lot of they like overshot but there again my mathematical sense and I am Pennsylvania journeyman heritage maybe that kicks in right. I want the more complicated things and, and I realize when I'm doing this um, not everybody's going to be interested in how it's done because it's I can't do it in my loom they'll say right. but uh, so I'm not sure to be honest do you think the uh, the number of uh, the number of shafts that are required to weave some of these complex structures are a bit of a hindrance do you think to the to the more complicated structures yeah but there's overshot a lot of people, the overshot were done by the English and, and the Appalachian area. Right. They only require four shafts. Right. Um, is there a large community of coverlet weavers? Are there more people learning to weave coverlets today? Not that I know of. Yeah. Um, in my sphere, I haven't met too many of them. Right. I do know that Texas has a state um, weaving conference every two years. And they've approached me to maybe come down there and do a program for them. Okay. They said, we've been studying overshot coverlets and we'd love to have something part of the state thing. So every once in a while I hear from people, but I'm, I'm not, besides Bill Leinbach, I don't, I have friends that are interested in old coverlets and they know the old coverlets, but they're not weaving them. Right. So if you, when you hear about them, let me know. <laughs> I'd like to learn about them Absolutely. too. But I assume, I just figured that's one of the reasons I have the website. I'm hoping to spread the information out there that there's a lot of things out there that are very beautiful and unique and we should perpetuate the history. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have, uh, do you have anything else that you would like to add? To no, I think I've covered most of it. Yeah, it's, been, it's been great. Um, so this has been Matthew Monk for the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of American History's National Coverlet Project interviewing Gay McGeary. Uh, here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, signing off.